everyone a very warm welcome to yet another really interesting edition of our research futures webinar my name is Leila Shukrun I'm professor of international law and director of the University of Portsmouth theme in democratic citizenship today we are absolutely delighted to welcome Sonia Carr and Dr Wendy Simshatton on an extremely important topic, a very relevant one, I'm afraid. You all know that during the pandemic, the most vulnerable have been even more vulnerable. So we are going to talk today about these hidden voices of the pandemic. But let me first introduce our speakers. Sonia Carr is the CEO of the Wilshire Ra Ra Racial Equality Council, RAC. Uh, it caters for a wide range of needs of families from ethnic minority communities, including support with court hearing, safeguarding and training, police and school. Sonia has a BA and an MA and over 15 years of experience working with the vulnerable children and families from ethnic minority communities. She has provided expert advice for numerous Numerous agencies as an organization, including school, the police, and local council. Sonia has given guest talk as part of hate crime events and conferences on inclusive practice. Sonia, thank you so much for being with us. We really appreciate that. We're very honored by your presence. And our colleague from the University of Portsmouth, Dr. Wendy Simshatton, she's a reader that is an associate professor, in other term, in childhood studies and director of past grade studies in the School of Education and Sociology. Wendy uh, is a BPS chartered psychologist and has researched and published very much in the areas of mental well-being and vulnerable children, such as children in care, care leavers, and children from disadvantaged and marginalized communities in local, in Portsmouth, but also national, and international settings, for example, in Egypt, Canada, or Indonesia. She has, um, her work has been funded by the Wellcome Trust, which is something extremely remarkable, as well as charities and Portsmouth City Council. Wendy is a coordinator of the Mental Health in Childhood and Education Hub at the University of Portsmouth, and she's also the associate editor of the Journal of Social and Political Psychology, as well as co-editor of the BPS Journal Psychology Teaching Review, and editorial board mentor, member of the Journal of Psychology therapies. So again, absolutely delighted to have you here, Wendy. Without further ado, I'd like to give you the floor. Everybody remember that if you want to ask questions, can you kindly use the chat box, which is on the right bottom <clears throat> corner of your screen. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Leila. Thanks for your kind introduction. I hope everybody can hear me. Feel free to interrupt me if you have a question, and I'm also very happy to leave questions till the end. I'm really excited to, to give this presentation together with my colleague Sonia, and we're talking a little bit, so we're going to talk a bit about our work uh, with really vulnerable families from ethnic minority communities. We've called it the hidden voices of the pandemic, and Sonia will be able to talk about that a little bit more. But before I go into the pandemic, I would like to talk to you a little bit about some of the work I did pre-pandemic. So my research is around mental health in childhood, specifically uh, mental health and well-being of diverse groups. When I say diverse groups, I've looked into mental health and well-being of children who, who've grown up in the care system and also looking at children and families uh, from ethnic minority communities. Now, the study I have done and that we're building on at the moment started back in 2017-18 when I was working with the Multifaith Forum in Wiltshire. And they approached me to look into mental health and well-being and support for the families they were working with and, and how this support could be improved. So we started working our way through what is the research. We started to do our own research. And what I'm going to talk to you about in the next couple of uh, slides is, a, is sort of a summary of what we did. So we know that families from a range of ethnic minority communities don't receive the mental health and well-being support they need. The main issue here is that often mental health support is structured along the lines of one size fits all. And even if, if, if sort of you know, adjustments are made, uh, the adjustments don't seem to reach uh, members from ethnic minority communities. And although I'm talking to you now about a study we did pre-COVID, but we see this especially in the current COVID-19 pandemic. So as an academic, I'm often asked to comment on work that's out there on, on recent publications around mental health and well-being of children and families in the pandemic. 
often the voices of ethnic minority communities are not there. They're not represented here, and that's a problem. So what I'm saying here, as you can see on the slide, there are a number of reasons for why current mental health support, and especially in the pandemic, does not uh, cater for the needs of those families from ethnic minority communities. So one reason is because the needs are unrecognized. The other uh, reason is, is, is when needs are recognized, uh, the way these needs are dealt with is done, as I was saying on my slide, in a slightly coercive way, which is not very helpful. So the current support is not appropriate. It also doesn't take account of the trauma and stress caused by issues around hate crime, for example. So we know that research highlights that social services are not adequate. We also know that families from ethnic minority communities are unhappy with a lack of support, not so much with the support they're getting, just the fact that they're not getting support. The key issue that we see here is that family dynamics, culture, needs and values are often not acknowledged. Stigma in how families deal with the stigma of mental health is not acknowledged. How families perceive mental health and well-being and, and what mental health is are the things that we need to conceptualise because we know that mental health issues are on the spectrum from uh, extreme mental health issues that are diagnosed to, to stress and anxiety. And we need to make sure that we incorporate the voices of ethnic minority uh, communities in this and not treat them as one. So again, Sonia will talk about this a little bit as well, because we've done quite a lot of work together on this front. So what do we know then? We know that a greater proportion of white families really uh, receive longer term support. When families from ethnic minority community communities get support, for some reason, these cases are closed much more quickly than the cases associated with families from uh, white backgrounds. We also know that due to issues, uh, you know, around stigma, uh, feeling that your voice is not heard, uh, wor being worried about your children being taken into care, there is a chance that, you know, the likelihood that families from ethnic minority uh, communities are, are sort of turning towards family is, is more, you know, so they tend to seek out support from families and friends first. There is sometimes a worry about you know, especially if people have been in touch with social services before, they feel like they can't open up because you don't know what's going to happen next. And social services uh, have a lot of uh, not a number of issues and stigmas uh, around certain communities as well. So it was back in, I think it was 2017, 18, when I was asked by the Multifaith Forum, and I also worked with Sonia at the time uh, as part of the REC, to, to look into this. So what is actually going on? And the Multifaith Forum in Wiltshire and the Race Equality Council in Wiltshire were working with an, a large group of people. And those were people whose voices weren't heard. So I was asked to look at what is it we can do? What do we need to do? And I decided to talk to a number of those families. And I've called this case studies. So I was very kindly introduced to a number of families who had been in contact with social services, uh, both by Sonia and, and the, the chair of the Multifaith Forum, Glenis. And I undertook a number of interviews, which was an eye opener. And some of it was quite shocking and upsetting. Although I'm quite an experienced researcher and I have interviewed many people as, you know, during the course of my career. Right. So, So here are some examples of the uh, interviews that I did. This is a person I, I interviewed and she said the following. The first time, so I was talking to her experience, sorry, my computer is going a bit loco. Going back to the earlier case. Ah, here we are, sorry, I kept clicking because my internet is quite slow at the moment. So I interviewed her. She'd been in touch with social services. She says the first time they were checking me out for neglect to see if I was neglecting my child. And it said on the father, somebody might have punched her in the face. Uh, no one has hurt my child. That wouldn't happen. But due to the fact, I think that we, we were a mixed family. So I was having a lot of people around. They weren't white. I think that the neighbors and social assumed that things were wrong. So these were families I talked to in relation to what is mental health and well-being? What sort of support are you getting? So this is a family who was known to social services uh, because of the mother's mental health issues and her child had been taken into care before, but she was doing well. 
But because of that and because of her worry and because of how she was perceived by her neighbours, things escalated a little bit for her. Here's another person I interviewed. She says, I'm saying this as a black person, I think they need to lighten up and stop thinking that everyone is out to scam the council or the government. There were some really quite heartbreaking stories that I dealt with. So I was at some point interviewing uh, the chair of, of the Multifaith Forum, who also told me that she had been in a position uh, wh where she went to the you know, social services with a client and, and literally people around her were saying, they're scamming the system. They're, they're going to try and get some benefit money out of this. It was hard. So there is stigma that's surrounding people and, and that makes it harder to seek help. Because it's a two way street. So what we're finding is, is that families from ethnic minority communities are sometimes less likely to seek help when they need it. But they're also less likely to get the help they need. I remember this interview vividly. I was in this person's house interviewing her about the support that her partner was getting from social services. And she told me the story. She said, I had a care worker come to the door. She knocked on the door. I opened the door. She looked shocked. And I was thinking, did you expect a white person? And whilst I was interviewing this person, uh, one of the care workers was around to support this person's partner uh, with their needs. And whilst we were talking about her experiences with social care and services, she was quite outgoing. She was sort of you know, talking about it, and then she got quite emotional. And the care worker walked past me, who was white like me, and kind of rolled her eyes. And I was thinking, so this is for me an example as a white person of othering, where somebody who's white like me is rolling their eyes like, what is happening here? It was hard. I also talk to a lot of volunteers because where I, I'm, I work at the University of Portsmouth, but I, I live in Wiltshire and there is some exciting work happening here as well. And a lot of people who, who work with vulnerable families. And here is a support worker who, who's, who's done an enormous amount of work with vulnerable families in schools. Um, and she said um, there is sort of a, a stigma a little bit where, where people act for well, your black, black people beat their children uh, and, you know, we have to be careful. And, and some really difficult stories where one family we worked with uh, had their children taken into care straight from the school because there was a, sort of an assumption that the parents had been hitting the children. And it turned out that it hadn't happened and that wasn't the case. And it was just something that escalated, but the parents were not heard. They weren't asked, they weren't talked to. So these things you could argue are misunderstandings, but it's also a lack of engagement with people's voices and needs. Another volunteer said something I just wanted to include uh, because of, of, you know, sort of society and systems in society and, and perhaps systems in British society, which contribute to this as well. There was this man who flagged up that these black kids were being called educationally subnormal. And he said, what the arrival of black people did was add a color wash to the class system of Britain. I thought that was really interesting, an interesting point to make. And, and sometimes I feel the families we work with, as Sonia will tell you, are wide ranging. We work with people from the traveler community and different backgrounds. And, and we do see sometimes that stigma of people say, yeah, but those people, they, you know, can't trust them. Yet we need to listen to people. So that's what I'm saying here. What can we do? Listen, talk to people, centralize their voices, use co-production. Don't, don't think you know, because a lot of the time we really don't know. I don't know. So how can we know is by talking to people, by asking them. So when I did the study, I interviewed 15 people and they were long in-depth interviews with um, people who were using social services, people who were supporting those families. And based on this and the co-production and talking to those families, we came up with a number of recommendations. Some speak for themselves. Staff training is needed, is urgently needed. And Sonia and I have gone into different settings to deliver training. And I'm talking about unconscious bias, but sometimes we need to move beyond this because of course, unconscious bias is great training, but we also need to realize that sometimes bias is not unconscious. Sometimes we see examples of racist bullying and we need to address this and not deny it. Centralize the voices of people who are affected by the practices that are supposed to support them. In other words, we need to talk to people and not just community leaders, but also the people who are hidden within communities. And again, that's where the Race Equality Council come in because the access and you know to people is 
enormous because of the trust people have in the Race Equality Council. And, and we've been able to do, especially Sonia, quite a lot of work on that front. Early intervention is, is obviously really important, but we need to not focus on one size fits all here. There are different sizes, different people, different needs, different cultures. So we need to take that on board. And again, it's about asking people, what do you need? How can we help you? And the final thing, and to me, that's the most important thing, is for a practitioner to be to reflect on their own practice. Who am I? Where do I come from? What, how, what do I think? And is there any chance that how I behave, how I think may influence my practice? And it might mean that some people, you know, that my practice maybe could be better. In other words, it's also about reflecting on yourself and realizing that maybe sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes we are biased towards certain people and that's a problem. So, of course, then COVID-19 happens. And then things started getting worse because what we saw was that the problems that were there before COVID, where people didn't get the support they needed, was starting to escalate. And, and you saw this sort of heightened and, and there were issues around educational support, social care, health and well-being. Now, this is across the country. I am not specifically talking about the area where we're based. I'm talking about the fact that COVID-19 has highlighted that there are enormous issues around support for members from uh, ethnic minority communities, members from diverse groups, and this is across the board, and much more needs to be done. And this goes back to what I said earlier on. As an academic, I'm sometimes asked to, to look at work that's been done around supporting vulnerable people with their mental health in COVID. The voices from ethnic minority communities are often absent from these uh, discussions, which is a shame. And that's where we come in. And this is a study that we're sort of hoping to do. We're on the brink of doing. And we are asking the question, how can we then better engage? And I've already started this study and, and come up with some findings. But now we need to know, well, well, how can we move forward? What can we do in this pandemic to make sure that everything is fair? So we've drawn on a number of theories and approaches. So centralizing people's voices, critical race theory, intersectionality, realizing that whatever somebody is, is complex. There is more than one element to us, to us. It's not just ethnicity. It might be social context, uh, social justice, inequality, social economic status. So the other thing that we have learned that's not helpful is embracing a form of color blindness, saying I don't see color. I treat everybody the same is a problem because we're all different. So that's not very helpful. Now, before I move on to Sonia, I'm just wanting to share this case with you. Uh, which is of a, a lovely girl that we've been working with, uh, for, you know, before the, the pandemic and during the pandemic. It's a person who is a mixed race girl who's been suspended from local secondary school for a year uh, due to aggressive behaviour towards staff and students. When I say aggressive, I'm putting that between quotes, but that was sort of the narrative. Uh, that's why this child was not able to go to school. The only child uh, lives in a council flat with a mother who's a single parent. Uh, the Race Equality Council have been helping. This obviously is not the real name of this person and not, not the real age. Um, and the issue was really that there was a sense that the racist bullying was happening, which wasn't engaged with. And sometimes racist bullying can trigger bad behaviour, but then the child is being judged by their behaviour and not the trauma that causes the behaviour. So no other services were involved, but the Race Equality uh, Council and especially Sonia were heavily involved in supporting this child. Then eventually, with a lot of work, and I got involved in sort of helping out these sessions in the school as well, uh, eventually the child was able to go back to school. And then, of course, COVID started. When COVID started, she could not go to school. But because of, of her situation, she was entitled to a free, free school dinner. So she was entitled to walk to school to pick up her school dinner. But she was too scared. Because if you remember the first lockdown, there was this sense of, uh, you, you know, police presence, be careful, you're not supposed to be out and about, blah, blah, blah. And she was worried. She didn't dare to, to walk to school to pick up her lunch because she was worried that somebody might stop her. So again, the Race Equality Council got involved. Some very good conversations with the police who were amazing and the school and things were slowly but surely getting better. So these are really interesting cases that we're working with. And I'm Passing over to Sonia, who, uh, as, as uh, Leila was just saying, has been involved in, in race equality work for a number of years and, and has done some super amazing work and, and is super active. And I don't know where she gets the energy from, but she works nonstop with really vulnerable people. 
Right, good, uh, after good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sonia Carr, and I'm the chair of Wiltshire Racial Equality Council. We're based in Trowbridge, and we have been here for over 40 years. And our client base stems from all over Wiltshire, not including um, Swindon. And as far as we're, we're concerned as an organisation, as long as you're part of the human race, we're here to help you. Next slide, please. The last census was in 2011. We're unsure of how many black, Asian, minority, ethnic people are in Wiltshire. We know that they are scattered all over Wiltshire and we can historically go back to the 15th century when in Khan the, the first Bane person is registered in a parish records. Next slide, thank you. Okay, so as I've just said, we're unsure of the number of Bane people in Wiltshire, so we, again, to, until the next um, census, that is when we're going to find out. Thank you, Wendy. Next slide. There are 45 different languages spoken in, in Wiltshire. Polish, Romanian, Gujarati, Farsi, and the most prevalent language in school is Nepalese. Thank you, Wendy. We have found many BAME students, and the word BAME stands for Black, Asian, Minority, Ethnic. And I say that because it's very important. Experience various levels of overt and covert prejudice throughout their day at school. These microaggressions cause pain and suffering. And um, some of these children have said to me, do I think they're crazy? And, uh, and, I, and, the, and our youngest victim is four years old. The only thing a four-year-old should be worried about is whether her unicorn is going to be pink or purple, not wanting to scratch herself white. Thank you, Wendy. Next slide, please. Racism incidents at school. When bullying is motivated by hostility or prejudice based on race or religion, it can be viewed as a hate crime. Bullying in itself is not a criminal offence, but if it is serious enough, it can be classed as a hate crime. Definition by the police. Bullying includes cyberbullying, which a lot of our students are facing either um, online or buying the mobile phone or Facebook, which I refer to as chat box. If a student experiences bullying at school, the school should deal with it under the school's own equality and diversity policy. And what we here at Wiltshire Racial Equality Council do, we get the parents to ask for the equality and diversity policy, speak to their child's head of year, ask questions, why? What is happening? You've got to help your child. This is what we tell them. They've got to go in and ask for answers. It's no point watching their child just cry and nothing is happening. They've got to go in there and they've got to challenge racism. Next slide, please, Wendy. Here, um, we've got the healing diary. Um, I get my children who I deal with to keep a diary. It's a diary, it's for them, it belongs to the child, it doesn't belong to anybody else. They can write whatever they want in there. All I provide are the pens and it is what a pe whatever pens are available at the time. And this particular diary is a page from a young girl who's been uh, racially abused since she, she was seven years old. And I will read um, in red what she has put. And this is what she writes. And this was happening to her every day at school. I have not been actively encouraged to report bullying since every time I try to, I get asked, are you sure that's bullying? Question mark. Or, or I get punished, um, calling people teachers racist. Because again, the teachers 
or the fellow pupils do not understand. In the green she has put, I have been physically bullied, verbally bullied, indirectly bullied. She threw social excuse, exclusion, spreading rumours, bullied online and bullied based on my ethnicity, race and religion. And this is what she's had to put up with every day at school. And to get her voice heard was a battle because the school weren't listening. And her fellow pupil just made it worse by just carrying on because she reacted. And her reaction was to lash out. So she, all of a sudden now, she becomes, instead of the victim, she becomes a perpetrator, a harasser. And for her, she's excluded from school. She, you know, she's not allowed to come back to school. She goes through various meetings with the teachers that and the school. It is painful to see it. And this young person said to me, do I think she is crazy? And of course I said, no, you're not. And I, one of the first things I said, we're going to keep a diary. It's your diary. You write whatever you want in there because nobody else is going to look in this diary but yourself. So she started to keep incidents for herself because it's getting it off her chest, writing it down on paper. It's a way of healing because I believe can all this pent-up hurt manifest and makes you hurt and bitter? And I wanted to, to get off her, and she can speak to her teachers. And one of the things we did at REC, Wiltshire Racial Equality Council, was we opened doors for her at school. She was given a teacher that she could speak to, and she could offload, tell her what is happening to her, why it's happening, what are her feelings. And this for us was a way forward and it worked for her. And because it worked for her, other children came. Other children from across Wiltshire. And these families are on the fourth generation. They, their great grandfathers fought for the king. They came to Wiltshire in the 40s. They helped to build up England, you know. They worked in the industry. Some of them actually lost their lives. And if you go around the various cemeteries where they're Commonwealth war graves, you'll see the graves of Commonwealth soldiers. And they are young. They are young. And this young lady, working with her, still working with her now, I'm not going to say her age, but she is a different child. It has been a challenge at times because she's been hurting and she doesn't want to listen so we've taken it at her pace she doesn't want to um write in her diary it's not a problem because it's her diary it belongs to her it's her ownership so all like i said before we've given her as a pen we've given her the tool the mechanism and we're here for her to talk to and what we have found now it's been a a long time that she has now finally wants to become a lawyer. You know, school for her. Okay, she's been homeschooled now, but she's come away from the pain of viewing everybody at school as horrible people. But now she, she feels she's safer to be educated at home. But we have, I believe we have won. We have won because we've got a little girl and her mother has her daughter Back, which is very very important and that's a message you know racism is very painful it is hurtful and it's very very demeaning next slide Wendy this word I'm going to apologize for this now this is one of the uh, microaggressions that she would face daily at school and it's and she'd get called can I call you a nigger and then the, ch the children, after she had lashed out and reacted, and they would say, we are only friends, because they know what they're doing. That microaggression made her cry. And, of course, she gets excluded. They get away. Another one is, um, is it cold where you come from? Where you, you know, horrible things that are demeaning for her. And for me, the word... The, the N word, is, its connotations are painful. 
and she doesn't deserve that. In fact, no child deserves any name calling at all. But this little girl would continually have this name leveled at her. So, of course, we back, went back to the school and we educated to say this is a derogatory word. Wendy, next slide, please. And then we're going to end our presentation by the words of a great man, Martin, in fact, I'm going to say Dr. Martin Luther King. And he says, do not judge a man by the colour of his skin, but by the quality of his character. And that is words I level to all of the young people I work with. Do not judge a man by the colour of his skin, but by his quality of his character, which is very, very, very important. And our work, my work, the work that I do is victim-centred. Wendy is the academic. We work in liaison with, with each other. And I find it, it has been a fantastic source and inspiration to get our children's voices heard. Because at long last, these voices are no longer silent. They are being heard. Thank you all. Next slide, Wendy. Thank you. Do we have any questions, please? Well, we do, Sonia, have a number of questions and comments already, but I think it's better if you won't mind finishing up your presentation and then we'll take all the questions. Leila, I, I have finished. Oh, you do have finished. Oh, oh. I that's yeah. fine then. I wasn't yeah. sure. Well, in this case, thank you very much. That was really very important to hear you. And the first thing I would like to say is thank you for the work you're doing. It's extremely important, not only because it's at the very local, very practical level, but also because it raises a number of extremely important issues we all dealing with, or if we're not, we should deal with them. I have a question for you, if you don't mind. It's for the two of you. Um, and uh, then, of course, I'm going to read all the questions that we've received, we are receiving. You know, in the context of these uh, research features webinars, because um, diversity, equality are extremely important to me, to the theme, we've often addressed uh, the questions of race, of caste. Last week, we had a race caste discussion of, uh, well, uh, Black Lives Matter, etc. One of the things uh, which strikes me is the perspective that sometimes we take or the conceptual tools. So in what you've said, you said often we are different, we are diverse, and that, of course, I fully agree with you. It's very important to acknowledge. Yet at the same time, and you'll understand I'm coming from an international law and law perspective, we are also human being, aren't we? And we also entitled to the same rights. So the rights perspective, the right-based perspective is very universal, although I know it's a fiction. Yet yeah, it is universal for what it is, and it comes with also some quality of universality. So how do you reconcile that in your practical work, this idea of diversity and universality to have access to all the same rights we are entitled to? Right. Wow. When did you want to start that one? That's that's an eye opener. Is that me? That's not me. To the presentation, but I have been struggling unmuting myself, <laughs> and my internet is is not playing ball. But I hope you can hear me now. Actually, yes, yes, we can. Me. Fantastic, uh, because I'm yeah. sort of struggling to unmute, because I wanted to sort of summarise first the talk and then go into uh, of the, the questions. Is that OK? And I'm really sorry about my uh, internet issues. So I'm, I'm, unless anybody says you can't hear me, I'm going to keep talking. I just wanted to sort of summarise that um, of research around mental health and well-being of, of families from ethnic minority communities before the pandemic. We noted, you know, blamed for their behaviour and, and what is underlying that behaviour is not. So we did quite, as, as you saw, you know, the interviews we did and, and the study we did, which we then 
published into a report and shared with stakeholders all over. It was lovely because it, it meant that we were able to go across the different places and talk about what was happening. It was an eye opener because I also then introduced tools, you know, for and that reached Manchester, London and other places. And that was really lovely. When misunderstandings, but misunderstandings that can end up being very, very difficult for people. For example, one of the key examples is about hair. And one of the people yeah, and another kid wanted to touch her hair. And she said she, she wasn't too happy with that. And when the mom approached the school, when the that's the whole point of it, isn't it? You know, sorry. Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Wendy. You know, sometimes we have trouble with your internet. Maybe one solution, would you mind switching off your video so that we hear you, but we don't see you? Right. All right. So if you don't. Okay, let's try again. Can you? Yeah, hear it me? seems better. If you don't mind repeating what you just said about the hair, because I think it's quite important, isn't it? Okay, I'm going to repeat it. And please interrupt me if you can't hear me again. My computer doesn't like WebEx. I'm really sorry about that. Um, so one of the cases we got involved in what was a typical case, but we call it typical because that's cases that, ha you know, these things happen a lot. A child in a school, child with Afro hair, other children touch the hair, they want to feel the texture, they, they want to feel the hair. And then mum went to school to sort of talk about this and say, my, my child is really uncomfortable because other children are wanting to touch the hair. The response was, but they like her. They really like her. And that's and that's what is sort of what we were trying to get at. It's that sort of thing that maybe intentions aren't bad. But they're also not so good because there is an unwillingness to engage with the fact that it is not okay to randomly touch people's hair because the hair is different. The other case Sonia was referring to is a little girl who we recently got involved in who is mixed race and she has been told that she, her skin looks grey and she was trying to scratch it off and she is really little, she's four, but she wanted to be white so she started scratching her skin. And it's there where, where the lack of understanding happens. Where, but, and we have been to some amazing schools where teachers have asked us, well, what do we do? And, and we say, well, live by example, because it's about showing what is right. And it's also about opening up those discussions and getting people in there to talk about the fact that we are different. You know, the, the color blindness is kind of not very helpful at all. Um, so these were the things that I just wanted to sort of uh, flag up. And ever since the pandemic happened, the, there have been a number of questions from the NHS, from the police, from schools, uh, asking for help. And I think that's a good thing. It's, it's asking, well, what do we do then? How do we centralise people's voices? Why is it that, you know, when offer is, you know, there is a support offer available, why is it that members from ethnic minority communities don't use it, people have asked? Well, it might be because the offer there doesn't suit their needs. It might be because the offer and whatever is available is, is let and shaped and coordinated by white people who are not necessarily trusted. So there is also an element of trust there. So I just wanted to sort of explain at the end of, of our conversation that COVID has shown issues, but issues that are going in two directions. We also know that members from ethnic minority communities are more resistant against being vaccination, vaccinated, you know, the, the COVID-19 vaccine. And again, here is where we can draw on communities to, you know, to be an example and, and to help people, uh, you know, you know, to basically make sense of, of motives and, and, and also open up the discussion. This is really important. But what we're most of all interested in is the underlying trauma post-traumatic stress disorder, which is underlying some of, of the behavior that we've seen. Hate crime has a real impact. Racist bullying has a real impact. And I think we need to acknowledge it because I find personally as an academic, when I use the word racist bullying, I'm often told, is it really racism though? Are you really sure? And be careful not to accuse somebody of a racist. But racist bullying doesn't necessarily mean that you accuse somebody of being racist. Racist is to say that bullying is motivated by maybe a racist element. So that's what I was sort of trying to get at, that there is a lot we need to do. And we're only at the beginning. I also wanted to say, though, 
we're working in Wiltshire, and of course I work in Portsmouth as well. I think the strength of Wiltshire is is the openness to to having those discussions, and the fact that the Race Equality Council is there in this country, in the UK. I would say there are around five to six race equality councils dotted across the country. The main one is in London. There's a few in the north. There's two in Dorset and and Devon. Uh, there's one in Wales. And, and we could do with more of, of those councils because they make a real difference. And, and the work that Sonia does is, is amazingly important because she she is approached by people who would normally not approach other services because they're just worried. And the Race Equality Council is not threatening. So, yeah. So back to your question, Leila, and I've kind of now forgotten what your question was, and I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> the good thing is that we could hear you very well, so it's, it's a bit don't see you but at least we hear you very well so the question was uh, you know around this idea is it a tension or not between universality we're entitled to universal rights and diversity so how do you reconcile that in your work yes we're different and yet at the same time we're not yeah so we're different so so the Everybody has the right for the same treatment, but everybody also has the right to, to have their own cultural norms and values within that particular treatment that is offered. So what I think we need to do is, is open up those debates where when we set up groups of support, we need to make sure that different groups are well represented. So when we talk about universal rights, we also need to then identify what are those? And, and what does it actually mean? Uh, for example, how do we construct our needs and who is actually representing us here? And going back to sort of the more the level of, for example, council level, uh, local level, for example, it's also quite important who is there that I can turn to. So if I have universal rights and, and I have a right to, to be supported and, and treated well, then who is there that I can turn to who I can trust and who I feel I, I trust to actually do the right thing for me, if that makes sense. And, and I think that's where we go wrong sometimes, is, is where a number of groups are not represented here. So universal rights then aren't not, nece they're not necessarily acknowledged. So what should be happening is not necessarily happening simply because the variety of people who could cater for those particular needs and rights are not incorporated, are not given a voice. And, and I think, well, my personal work starts from the notion of co-production, uh, mm -hmm. redefining rights. I redefine mental health and well-being. I, I am not a big fan, for example, of traditional diagnostic systems, such as biomedical models. So I think if we're talking about rights in relation to mental health support, then what is mental health and what is mental illness? So we need to also then go back to people and ask, well, what, what does it mean to feel bad for you what does it mean for you so so yeah so i'm a social constructionist so i tend to sort of construct you know look at what mm -hmm. underlies underpins our understandings of rights and well-being and support if you like of course i, 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 echo, sorry, no, no. I echo everything wendy has just um stated and f for my work um it's victim centered i am led by the victim you know and it's it's sometimes it's not it's it's hard to get their voices heard because people don't always because a lot of statutory agencies have a one size fits all approach and everybody has different needs and different values and what i have found is some of their parents or grandparents are from the old and the older than you do not always mix so we're fighting cultures because their children are black British where their families will still have a lot of the weight from home. And when I say home, the countries where their parents were, or grandparents were born. And that is some of the stigma and some of the obstacles we're having to fight up against. We're having to educate on all sides. Thank you so much, Sonia. So I believe education and representation, we'll get back to that. We've received a number of comments and questions, really. So the first one from Jillian, there are parallels with the experience of disabled people stigmatized as benefits granters. Are there other parallels you've come across? The traveling, the traveling community. 
the, you know the tra the travelers that is that is you know if anything gets stolen um destroyed pets are taken that is automatically t t is the travelers whether it is or not and it's nine times out of ten it's not so yes i've come across that quite a lot of times mm, surely that's that's really interesting yeah, yeah. um a next question then uh, from and we've received quite a lot so my apologies if i'm missing a few i'll try not to miss any question uh Liz, it's always important to look at the meaning behind the behavior, the communicative function of the behavior. So we addressed that slightly, but what do you think? Yes, the meaning behind behavior is, is indeed absolutely key because what we see too often is that behavior is judged and not what, what could cause that behavior. So the case I showed you in one of my slides was a person who, who was basically uh, told your behavior is out of control. Uh, you can't be at school. This is just, just not a good thing. What, what hadn't happened enough, uh, not enough conversations had been had about the underlying uh, causes, namely bullying, racist bullying. And I do realize it, it is hard to separate bullying from racist bullying and, and to sort of, you know, make sense of what does it mean. And, and what we have found, Sonia and I as well, is sometimes when somebody interprets something as racist bullying, their own interpretation is doubted. It's almost like, well, you may feel that that's what's happening but are you sure that it's is that what it is are you sure there is no misunderstanding are you sure that, that you are not just being a bit sensitive or you know so absolutely definitely and of course there are other traumatic elements as well you know issues at home in the current covid what we're seeing is that um families are you know especially for certain types of ethnic minority communities are, are more likely to live in poverty uh crowded situations less likely to get certain help that they need uh you know when it comes to their mental health well-being educational support uh think about when the uh, gcses and other exams were cancelled and predicted grades were used well we know that this will put ethnic minority children at a disadvantage because predicted that predicted grades tend to be lower than uh than white children and it's not again uh, deliberate but there seems to be a tendency to to you know for their predicted rates to be lower which might be unconscious bias again so yeah sonia would you like to add that? yeah and and for the again for the community they don't want to uh, go out for help because they don't want to have their children taken off them that they've got this um, block. They feel if they uh, call out for help, the, the council are going to all social services will take their children because they can't cope. So they will mud along in whatever way they can, and that is one of the reasons why they don't come out for help, mm. even if they are desperate. You know, and the children, and I, uh, we've just had to get a load of laptops because we've got children facing digital exclusion. And when I say children, that's across the board because we've got the BAME children, the Eastern European and the travelling community mm. all facing digital exclusion. And, and again, all of these people don't want to reach out to the statutory agencies for help because they feel like they will be, it's a sign of weakness and children will be taken off them. So they muddle on. They, and then when they come to us at REC, it's at the last chance because they all, you know, they are desperate. Somebody has picked up on something and they need our help like now. Mm -hmm. uh, in relation to that, we have a question common from Mahmoud. He says, uh, is there a non-communicative aspect to behaviour too? I find a... I'm going to say, I find a lot of the, well, some of the churches and the misconceptions, some of the churches and the misconceptions do not help us. And we really have to work on some of the faith, houses of worship to dispel a lot of the myths out there to make our lives easier. Because we've, we've got, we were on the, in some of the children that we're on the fourth generation. Mm -hmm. You know, so you know, I say to them, "When are they going to be? When are they going to be equal?" Yeah. Then when are they going to be equal? They're, this is a fourth generation. They know no other way 
They are black British and fourth generation. Of course. Mm -hmm. And and it is in, indeed what, what we see with the children that we've you know supported in school as well. It, it's that sort of you know notion about resilience. Resilience is always understood as uh, you know you're able to to cope, you're able to move on. But resilience, an element of resilience, is also resistance. Resistance means that you are able to stick up for yourself, but you're resisting stuff. So. When it comes to the question about behaviour, yes, what we see with children who experience racist bullying, feel they're excluded, they stop cooperating. They, they don't want to do the work. They don't want to be included. They don't want to do it. And that's resistance. Now, resistance is part of resilience. It is a way of showing this is how I cope. This is how I am resilient. I'm not doing it. I'm not accepting how you're treating me, but I'm powerless within this because you're not listening to me. So. I'm, I'm no longer engaging. So these are also things that need to be picked up is, is you know, children who are absolutely powerless in this situation. Yeah, uh, thank you, Wendy. That's, that is very good. That is, what, what Wendy has said is, is, is Leila, is, is 100%. It's 100%. We get, we, what we are doing is giving the children back a voice. Mm -hmm you know giving them power because they just wanted to be the the lower end job they never had aspirations to be doctors professors and i say why not why not why can't you be the next prime minister why why you know you've got to aim high and you know and i say to these children go to school educate because a pen is mightier than the sword and that's always my mantra and they know what I'm going to come out with. The pen is mightier than the sword. And I say, if you're going to talk to me, read me Shakespeare. Read me Shakespeare. And that's what I tell them. Because as Mahatma Gandhi said, in order to achieve change, we must challenge. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I think as, as teachers, educators, we can only agree with you, Sonia, on all that. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have an interesting comment from Shun. I think it very much down to first impression and awareness of how it is perceived by other. Don't go into a situation with a plan or an agenda. Let it flow to trip them individualized. Body language is so important. So I think it relates to everything we said before. Yes. Yeah, that is, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another question uh, from uh, Sianan, um, I hope I pronounced your name well, a uh, question from Wendy, um, really interesting research and great to see that these groups had their voice heard. How can other researchers look to gain access to groups such as these without a gatekeeper, especially during COVID, COVID times? So how can people get access to groups? Mm -hmm. Without a gatekeeper, especially during COVID time, so how do you get access? How do you do your field work, so to speak? I think for us, what has been a strength, and, and for, for my sort of work as an academic, as a white person, but also as a foreigner, because I'm not British, and, and I think, again, that adds to, to how I approach the world. I don't know, I mean, uh, I'm from the Netherlands, and I'm well aware of, of what's happening in the Netherlands, when it, but anyhow, that's a different story. I think it's, it's, it's where... In my case, I was approached by the multi faith forum and, and by uh, Sonia as well, because I got to know Son Sonia quite well. And, and I think that's the strength of some of the work that we're doing is that we're actually able to access those people who are very hard to access because of, of you know, the they're, they're sort of uh, bad experiences with, with researchers, with social care, with other people before. And so from that perspective, to an extent, for my work, Sonia has been the gate, gatekeeper and, and the multi-faith forum as well. So gaining access to, to people is also how you present yourself. Years ago, when I did my PhD and I, I looked at a whole different thing, uh, mothers and female employment, I presented myself as a psychologist doing a PhD. Well, that's not a great thing to do. It's not good to go into an interview with participants and say, yeah, I'm a psychologist. Immediately, people think you're there to analyze them and you know, so it's also about how do you present yourself? And and I present myself as somebody who simply doesn't know. I'm a white person, but I'm a foreign person. So I know what it's like to be a foreigner in a foreign country. I know what it's like for people to tell you to go back to your own country and whatever. But I don't know what it's like to be a different skin color. So I 
we have these conversations where we share experiences and and i think to me it's been an eye-opener and and hard at times really hard because it's confrontational because you, you do really see that, that people's experiences can be pretty awful but it's also acknowledging that you don't know i mean i was interviewing a lady and she said wendy you will never know what it's like to be a black woman you don't know you don't know what it's like to be in tesco's and you're queuing up and the queue takes forever and then it's your turn and they're looking at you and they're thinking you're going to be aggressive or you're going to shout at them because you've been in the queue for a long time no i i don't know that but through these conversations and, and these you know interviews we learn from each other i don't know sonia if you've got anything yeah, yeah. yeah I, I do i wouldn't look upon myself as a gatekeeper all i am is the messenger mm -hmm. the, the people come to me because um yeah i look like them Mm. okay so and then i listen i always listen i've always got a listening ear and they know that and also if you had one success that friend will they would have that person would have known of that success and, and a lot of my the people that i work with have come by word of mouth and it's 15 plus years of word of mouth and i've built up a relationship with the statutory agencies the local constabulary the local authority, so I am known, and I, and I've worked hard to build that relationship, mm. so they know that I will listen to their voice, and then I will speak to the relevant person to ask for a help, and it will be a two pronged approach to assist this p person, and we have adults being victimised at work too, so it's not just children. Mm -hmm. Uh, a question which relates somehow uh, on the complexity from uh, Mason. Newer communities such as refugees and asylum seekers face many challenges where communication is further hindered by language barriers. Yeah, yeah. language line. I, hi, Mason. I, I always... Tonya. Use, sorry, sorry, hi, Mason. Hi. I, always, I always use language line. I would mm -hmm. find out what language the, the person speaks with is there anybody in the local authority who speaks their language and again this is not just a one visit it's probably three or four times before i even get the first bit of the case mm. and i you always always use language line yeah it's something we work very hard on trying to say to people that uh you know dealing with 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 a group of people who have language and cultural um challenges yeah. you know that first bit of communication is actually somebody speaking their language it's so so important many many people realize they'll go in and speak to them in english and 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 you know people are polite and nod their heads and smile and, and people get the impression that they you know they can understand what they're saying it's such a key thing to dealing with that sense of exclusion is that people are not, you know, listening or speaking in a language that they can understand. So, yeah, thank you, Sonia, for everything and, you and, do. And, and also, I always find out what my victim faith is. If it's mm. a Muslim, I would never shake a Muslim man's hand. Yes. I would cover my head. I would mm. take my shoes off at the front door. So it's mm. homework for me before I get to see yeah. my, my victim. A, yeah. lot of, a lot of homework because yeah. you never shake a Muslim man's hand because I'm not, on, well, as a woman and a non-Muslim. Mm -hmm. Well, we yeah. deal, we, we, we support, I support refugees, Syrian refugees in Wiltshire, uh, at Wiltshire Council, and we rely a lot on volunteer support. So we do specific cultural awareness for mm -hmm. volunteers on how to make, because it's a, it's a two-way thing. Yeah, you know, we expect people to integrate, but also for for the Syrians to understand British culture, but also people um, helping them and supporting them to understand their culture. It just makes things so much uh, more, you know, the misunderstandings can be avoided or sort of decreased very early on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In relation to that, really, we've received so many questions and comments. We'll we'll keep them for you, uh, Sonia and Wendy, so that you know what people will discuss. Really, yeah. I, I sort of promise to read everything. I'm conscious of time. Of I won't have time, but I'm going to say you a few things. Um, well, a number of colleagues were mentioning that there are teachers in primary school, and that has been extremely useful for them. They were also asking whether when the school open or maybe online. And I hope the school open pretty soon on my side. 
um, <laughs> can we have discussions about that, including with small children to yeah. uh, educate them? Yes, definitely, definitely. We're here. Just got to. All they're going to do is shout. But we're here. You know. Excellent. You know. We will do whatever. We want. We want a diverse community, and we want when it's, it's the next Olympic Games that uh, it's all children, well, adults of all races, are flying the flag for whatever countries they're representing. Mm -hmm. You know, we want a world where everybody is judged by their own merits and not the colour of their skin. Absolutely. And and maybe that's the last question because we've touched upon this issue and, and obviously it's a question which is complicated and uh, must be addressed. A question from Amra, a Muslim woman with head scars who are spat on, starts pulled and call terrorists. Can the panel suggest how can we, uh, how can the person be supported and how can we educate the society? So in relation to indeed differences, education. Well, well, I'm going to start on this. What we're doing, we're going into schools and we're giving training to the teachers and for the teachers then go out to educate their pupils. And then when the victim's family come to us, we educate with them. Again, it's, a, it's sometimes it's a language barrier. So we ha need to find out what language the, the victim is speaking and it's we speak in their language and we we try we do our best it's not an easy journey because it will take us literally up to six months to a year to for, for the victim to feel safe to to go out it's not easy for her it's a horrible journey because i've not been in her shoes to be spat at or had a hijab um, pulled but I, for me it's a learning curve and and for learning, we have to educate. We've got to educate. And I can't use the word enough, educate, educate. Of course, of course. And I think, Sonia, it's going to be the conclusion because okay. there won't be any better conclusion than that, especially for us, I suppose. So educate to diversity, to equality, to all these ideas we've discussed together. Thank you so much. It was a fascinating discussion and a very important one, not only in the context of the pandemic, but generally speaking, because I believe that many of us have embraced this profession from primary school to university for these reasons, to educate, to share knowledge and to be better. So thank you so much. The discussion is going to be on the website, Research Futures. I'd like to thank you as an audience. I see many of our loyal audience member here. Thank you so much. And thank my team as well, Gloria, Olga, her and Claudia in particular. We'll see you very soon. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.